everybody and welcome to our Legends of Chess Q&A and today we are joined by commentator extraordinaire, Hearthstone player extraordinaire, eight times Russian champion, Twitch streamer, just an all-round legend, Peter Swidler. Hi Peter. Hi everyone, yeah very very ordinary Hearthstone player but I yeah the rest of it has some some you know reality behind it. I mean, let me let us just tell the viewers that right before we came on the show, you were actually playing Hearthstone just now. You had yeah. literally 10 minutes between your last game and this interview. Not, not 10 minutes, no. <laughs> 10 minutes would have been would have been stretching it a little bit, but I, I did have half an hour or, or so. So I, of course, did something productive, as one does. <laughs> and you also mentioned that you're not a fan of APM games which apparently, if you guys don't know, means action per minute, because I had no idea what it meant. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't do. And this kind of bleeds into my chest these days, unfortunately. I, I get very panicky when I'm, when I'm seriously low on time. And uh, uh, part of it is uh, APM issues. Not all of it. It's also obviously brain slowing down with age, but, uh, but part of it definitely is, is to do with APM issues. Oh, that's quite an interesting analogy, Peter, that having not really enjoying the action per minute setup in uh, games also transfers to chess when when the time gets low on the clock and uh, heart rate increases. So then how are you liking this format that's going on with the Armageddon right after the rapid play? I th I've been, you know, we've uh, we've been doing uh, doing work on uh, on the tour as commentators up until up until now, and uh, uh, I was surprised, but also very excited to get an invite to play in one because uh, I think the format is very interesting, and I I haven't uh, I played a little bit uh, since uh, since the lockdown started, but uh, this is clearly the you know, the strongest event I've played in so far. And um, <clears throat> it was always going to be very exciting to, to get back into, you know, to tr try to compete against, uh, against the best. This always uh, has been uh, the easiest for me to motivate myself for uh, playing in the, in the absolute top events, because uh, uh, if, if you can't get properly excited by, by that, then, uh, probably this is, uh, you know, a wrong choice of profession. Okay, and that's that's a great answer. Um, before we get into the Q&A part of it, which is going to be questions that the Chess24 premium members have posted, and there are quite a few of them. Uh, so just be ready to be up for another six hours, Peter, approximately. But I know today is not the best day because you had a tough day with um, uh, in the event today, but just your exp you've been playing, you've been playing pretty good. You're, you're amongst well, at least the top half of the of the standings. Just your experience in the tournament so far, going into round five tomorrow. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's kind of weird because I felt like today was maybe the uh, the day I felt the most in control of my own head, and I finally played, uh, you know, a game of chess from start to finish. Uh, which was kind of nice because I think in the first three days I couldn't name a single game there that was like played properly by me, by my opponents occasionally, but by me from from start to finish it was uh, it was always very very uh, you know piecemeal and uh, generally tons of mistakes. But the game one, uh, the game one I played against uh, against Ding today, I felt like. Uh, it wasn't perfect, but uh, it felt to me like I was making sense for most of it. Uh, and in general, you know, beating somebody uh, of Ding's strength uh, in, in that fashion without, you know, any horrific blunders on 30 seconds uh, is, is a very pleasant feeling. And then I had basically, uh, I had a brain fade in game two and then an opening disaster in game four. Uh, and ended up actually losing today uh, instead of any of the previous days where I think I would have taken a loss uh, a lot easier because uh, I, I felt like I wasn't in control at any point uh, against either of my first three opponents. 
I I feel like I was on uh, uh, on nine out of nine uh, and could have easily been on zero out of nine instead, and really wouldn't have, it wouldn't have felt unjust or or undeserved, and I would have felt yeah that's how I play that's that's my points, <laughs> uh, but today today I actually felt like I was playing fine uh, for most of it. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm taking away zero points from that effort, but uh, it's uh, that's the nature of things, I guess. You've been having a great tournament, and for the Chess Twenty Four team, that's kind of extra special because you've been such a huge part of the commentary team for this entire Magnus Carlsen Chess Tour. Are you missing commentary at all? Uh... <laughs> I mean, not not re- like you can be yeah, yes, honest. You, no, yes and no. I mean, uh, I, I really like uh, the, the the squad that uh, Chess Twenty Four assembled for this. I think uh, whenever Sasha is on, is is like a holiday, and uh, uh, I'm very much on the record loving uh, you, you know that I love working with with Jan and with you, and uh, uh, it's uh, it would have been fun, but. I'm sort of uh, first couple of days. It was, I think, mainly to do with how with how I played because uh, I do like it's not a pose. I am kind of harshly critical of my own play. It's it's not something I do, you know, outwardly to project an image. Uh, I uh, I am, and I think, always has been my my own harshest critic in terms of uh, quality of games. And there were occasions during the first three days where I, th- I was just sitting there thinking, what am I doing in this tournament? Despite, you know, scoring points and everything, I just thought, you know, yes, for some reason, people are gifting me points, but, you know, I should be playing better. And if I'm playing like this, it's, it's not an immediately obvious why, why I'm in the thing. Uh, but I'm, I'm warming up and uh, it's, uh, it's very exciting to, uh, to be playing these fields again. Very exciting for us to watch you play. And as much as I would like to hijack this interview, of course, everybody's saying that I, you know, I need to stop doing that and ask the real questions by our premium members. So let's get to that, uh, Peter. And the first question is by Master Gambit. And he says, hi, Peter. Do you think mastering chess can be helpful outside of chess? Which qualities are trained by it? And do you prepare yourself mentally for a competition in a special way? Mental strength and self-confidence seems to be very important to me because purely weak chess skills. Thank you and good luck in the tournament. So what kind of traits do, does chess really develop and how do you prepare yourself mentally for a competition, Peter? Uh, I think the first part of the question is sort of more interesting than the second because, you know, my preparation is not really very interesting at all. These days, uh, I... I actually, I was on the call uh, for about 20 minutes listening to the back end of uh, Kramnik's interview. And many things that he said there kind of echo with me uh, quite a bit. Uh, some things I already mentioned, like the, the issues with playing on very low time and, uh, you know, the feeling that, you know, the, the motor skills part of online chess probably has passed me by. I used to be quite good when I was like 20, 25, but... Uh, doesn't really feel like I can get back to those levels, uh, but also what he was uh, what he was talking about, and it, it will feel slightly hypocritical because I obviously have never worked as much as he worked on chess in his life. But uh, that thing he said about finding it difficult to motivate himself to uh, to do you know clicking and opening work uh, that does come harder and harder for me. Uh, it's not like I'm incapable of it, and uh, uh, I, because I, I have now, you know, officially embarked on writing yet another opening course. I will have to do it by by necessity, and I've I've been doing that, and uh, I've I've uh, kind of rediscovered that, you know, when you when you study interesting opening positions, you can still get excited about them, and you can still sort of wake up two hours later and think, where did this time go? You know, I I looked at so many interesting things but uh generally speaking for myself uh, my preparation for tournaments these days is uh just you know drink more water 
you know, stay hydrated, stay fresh, you know, do a workout in the morning. Uh, try to get to 5 p.m. when I have to sit down and play in a, some kind of, in, in, in a, as positive a frame of, a frame of mind as possible. I don't actually do much in a way of uh, chess preparation. I do some in between games when like the battlefield becomes clear, when the openings are declared in games one and two, so to speak, and there is something to perhaps patch up or correct or, or adjust, but not before game one. Uh, mm. the, the larger question, though, uh, what you can learn from chess and what chess skills can be uh, transferred uh, into real life. That one is, uh, I wouldn't say I thought a lot about this, but I, it's a question that does get asked every now and again. Uh, so I had occasion to answer it before. And I, uh, in particular, I think when you, when you talk about picking up chess as you know, a, a hobby and a potential profession for children. Uh, when you when you just start, you know, getting acquainted with chess at a, at a young age, I think apart from things that everybody will mention, like spatial, you know, spatial awareness and uh, you know some counting skills and logic and and all these things that that are quite obvious and you know for, for the, the surface level answer would be that. But what I think is maybe the most important is uh, the this. I don't know if social is the right way to describe it, but chess will teach uh, children to lose and to accept that they've lost, and it wasn't anybody's fault. Because you, once you've sat down, it, you are in charge of those pieces. You can't really claim any kind of outside outside mm. influence. If you lost, it was because your opponent played better uh, than you on the day. Uh, and uh, I think it's it's a very, very important skill which we are sort of moving away from. Once again, I am I am not a teacher. I you know my opinion should probably be disregarded in large part. But I think there is definitely some merit to the you know everybody is a winner approach to. Uh, child upbringing that we see, I think, more and more these days. But there should still be some anchoring in 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 real life. And the, the chess, I think, does a very very good job of uh, teaching you how to lose with dignity, and just generally get acquainted with the idea that not everything in life will go exactly according to how you would like it to go. Mm, that's uh, and uh, I think it's very very useful. Uh, it's it's maybe not the most pleasant of lessons you will learn at the age of, I don't know, five. Uh, but I think it will stand you in good stead going forward. Mm. Uh, so that's that's what I think is maybe the uh, the biggest advantage to uh, to learning a game like chess uh, for, from an early age. And, uh, you know, in more general terms, uh, I think we had this discussion on one of the broadcasts, uh, possibly, that uh, chess players, in particular professional chess players who have spent decades on the game, they do, uh, I wouldn't say we are necessarily very rational, but we think we are. Uh, and there is definitely um, um, a temptation to, to treat life as just a very, very difficult game of chess, which you can still attempt to solve. Uh, and, and that can lead to hilarious results because obviously uh, chess is a game with complete information and life is very much a game with incomplete information. So uh, attempting to solve it as a chess problem will, and I speak from personal experience, will uh, result in things which maybe will be funny. And like, they are funny to me now, but they weren't very funny to me then. Uh, I, have, I have one specific experience in mind when I speak of this where I, I made a long calculation in a complicated position. And I thought this is what the position will look like in like three years. And then I thought this is what the assessment of this position will look like in three years. And apparently my calculation about the line that my life will take was absolutely correct, but the assessment turned out to be absolutely the opposite. And uh, I'm, I'm laughing now, I wasn't laughing then. 
that's insanely well put peter damn now i know why you're such a good commentator uh i i think i'm i'm especially thinking about what you said about the earlier thing about this about how chess inculcates this system of learning to deal with adversities in a very young age by actually being responsible for them and taking responsibility for your actions and accountability for it and sort of knowing that you have to go back there next day to play the next round so standing up from your failures and i think that's uh, that at my level whatever chess i have played i think i can also really vouch for that this is a huge learning but i think this this is true for sports i think yeah. sports in general teaches us this Sure, I mean chess is not unique in this uh, in this regard, but because, like, once again, I'm probably biased because I love the game and this, you know, it's really the only thing I've done seriously in my life. So, I'm, I'm obviously, I think, uh, likely to overstate the the importance of chess and the, you know, how good chess is, is in this regard. But because of how how pure the game is and how, you know, difficult it is compared to. To, to to other sports it's a one on first of all it's a one on one game there is no team element involved so you are solely in charge of yourself and there's really about as little as little outside interference during the game as as you can imagine i think when when playing any kind of uh any kind of sport so yeah chess chess does a good job uh, on that count 100% agree. Okay, Peter, let's move on to the next question sure. because I think this is one topic that we can go on forever, the benefits of chess. Turi wants to know, hi Peter, in the commentary for Linderus Abbey tournament, you mentioned that you didn't think there was a significant correlation between general intelligence and being able to play chess on a high level. Do you think there is no correlation at all or it's or is it simply not as obvious as some people think? Uh I think uh, they're like I don't know. I uh, it would be interesting to to try and figure it out scientifically. But my suspicion is there is almost none. I mean, chess is just a very very specific skill. It trains uh, it trains things which are generally useful. But uh, I I don't know how well that translates into into general intelligence. And I think we. Uh, those of us who, who have been around the chess world can name, you know, examples from you know both ends of the uh, both ends of the uh, the graph there. Uh, but I think it's mainly whenever I say this, I say this as a you know a response to perhaps something that I only imagine people say very much. But I think there is this. At least in some people, there will be, you know, this instant, uh, maybe not a quality sign, but something approaching, uh, you know, this equation, good chess player equals smart person. And I think that is, you know, a gross oversimplification and probably is just flat out untrue. Uh, chess does make you s smarter, I guess, than you were before you started. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think it makes you automatically smart for whatever smart means. The, the, the problem with all these statements is that, you know, quantifying what what makes a person smart is is going to take us, you know, we're not we're not going to get there. Basically, let's let's just not attempt doing that. Is it? Do you think? intelligence are these different kinds of there are different kinds of intelligences, right? And chess probably does develop a few aspects of it, like whether it's spatial intelligence, pattern recognition, memory, these different aspects do get trained by chess. But in general, you cannot say that, you can't say that you have to be intelligent to play chess or a chess player is intelligent, but it does develop certain it, skills. It, it, it definitely does train, uh, train certain skills in your brain, which are, some of them are more useful than others, but all of yes. them, you know, uh, I mean, memory in particular, uh, training your memory is is going to is going to be a useful skill in in anybody's life. But yeah, there's just uh, as long as there is no immediate. Uh, uh, I I just dislike generalizations and uh, quite a bit, and uh, I think that's okay, my biggest problem with this. Fair enough. So Peter's hot take to that is that 
being good at chess doesn't necessarily imply that you're very intelligent. But I have to say, Peter, in general, the perception, which is good and lucky for us chess players, is that at least for people who don't play chess, they just automatically think and they just they just perceive us as uh, as being smart and being intelligent. So works works for all of us. <laughs> Uh, it's it's not bad. I, like we we probably shouldn't fight it so hard. Yeah. No, I we don't, shouldn't. I don't think I don't think it's an image problem. It's uh, let's not. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Next question, Peter. JS, we am is saying hi, Peter. Have you ever played a game of chess without making your own moves? I mean that everything was preparation. Thanks and good luck in the Legends tournament. Um, I've come close. I. I think maybe there is. Uh, I'm thinking of a couple in particular. I think it's very possible that more or less the entire game I won against Maxim uh, in, um, I think it was 2010, I want to say maybe 2009. I, we, we played in San Sebastian, and Maxim just, uh, he told me later that he got food poisoning like the day before and he had to spend like the entire night uh, dealing with the fallout from that. And he came to the board kind of dizzy and in no shape to play and still entered the absolute sharpest marshal he could find and obviously mixed up the move order. And I have a feeling <laughs> that final position may have been in the file. Uh, and there was also a game I won against uh, Sasha Grishuk in Mexico City in the uh, well, I think they were the world championships those days. These days, it would just be a candidates tournament because the formula is exactly like a candidates tournament. Um, uh, I I had a very important... But, but that game definitely continued past the novelty, but the novelty was around move 30 or something. <laughs> so oh, <wow. laughs> maybe, maybe not 30, but uh, like I, I, I had to start at around move 30, but that doesn't entirely count. But yeah. I, don't have, I don't have very many of those examples in my career because I, I have never really been a particularly, you know, opening bass player. I want to expand a little bit on that question because I find it quite fascinating as a player myself that, you know, of course, it's really, um, it's very satisfying to play a beautiful game, which is a long fought game where both strong players played their best chess and to win that sort of a game. But also, is there a certain satisfaction in winning a game out of, because of your strong opening prep? prep? Because opening preparation is also, of course, part of the hard work and everything. I mean, how would you compare these two kind of wins? Well, for me, you know, it's hard to compare because I've, I, you know, for me, the ledger is heavily skewed in, in uh, you know, in the first column. I, uh, it's not like I, I've never gotten any prep in and I've never won games more or less out of the opening, but they are really few and far between. Uh, but yeah, it, it is a very satisfying feeling, in particular if, you, if it's your own work, because people these yeah. days, there's a lot of... Uh, you know, co-ops going uh, going on and people working with teams, and uh, that doesn't make it worse. But it's slightly different when it's something that was given to me. For instance, that game against Grishuk that I mentioned, that was basically just something that my my second at the time, Alexander Motorov, just gave me a file on the morning of the game, and somehow that file turned out to be relevant. And I was extremely grateful to him, and it was a good day for for both of us. But uh, like it's. I feel like it's his novelty, not mine, despite me being the one who got to play it. Uh, I, th I still would probably prefer a hard-fought game over the board to to uh, to winning something from uh, sort of from home. Uh, but uh, generally, you know, getting um, getting a payoff for 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 hard work done done in advance is also a very satisfying feeling. Very satisfying thing and gives you more time to go play some Hearthstone. So that's absolutely, always... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's always a good thing. It also reminds me of this really interesting thing that Vishy said in an interview with Surya recently. Uh, it's a, it was a brilliant interview where uh, Peter he mentioned that you know at your level, at this elite level, there's so much talk about opening prep and now how chess has become just about openings. And Vishy gave a very interesting uh, insight into it that at an elite level, which you all play in. To even get to the middle game or the end game, you need to have a solid opening prep. So that's the only way to really get to a reasonable middle game to start with. And moving on to Hubisa's um, question, coming up with all the big questions here. Do you still love Jimi Hendrix music? Yeah, I've, sadly for me, I've, uh, 
I don't listen to music anywhere near enough these days. I, I need to go back to the habit of listening to, uh, to music, you know, more than just occasionally. Um, it kind of, uh, listening, listening to music and, and Hendrix in particular was my kind of going, going to war music. I would, uh, there was a specific sequence of two tracks on, uh, Electric Ladyland that I listened to before going, uh, going to play, uh, in like the mid nineties, maybe to, to the early two thousands. And in those years, I was a lot more kind of music centered, uh, than I am now. And then our kids were born and, uh, sort of playing music at home became difficult because, you know, they needed sleep. And also when, when they were actually asleep, we needed sleep. And, and, uh, I kind of started gravitating towards other things. And, uh, that resulted in, in, in basically in two things. My musical taste has basically stayed the same for the past 20 years. I haven't really discovered much that I, you know, sincerely love. Uh, but that's quite clearly because I haven't really been looking very hard because I'm, I'm very comfortable with, uh, with the music that, that, you know, soothes me and brings me joy. And I don't necessarily even feel I need to find like, um, if, if you know, you like something, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be a quest to find more things you liked or to, or to find things that replace those. Uh, but yeah, my music taste is very, very. Uh, still very much based on uh, on those years, uh, yeah. and and also I've I've I'm just not listening to enough music these days, which is regrettable. I I don't like it myself, but that's how it is. Mm. But I still I still like Hendrix. Yes, like that was a question that could have been answered in three seconds, and instead, <laughs> instead that's what I did makes Peter Peter. Yeah, I should probably okay. revise revise that strategy because you probably have a reasonably long list. Yes. All right. Uh, which is the one song which is again? This is obviously not on the question list. Just me expanding on stuff. Uh, which is the one song that's on repeat right now for you? And Peter, this has to be a five-second answer because we've got a really uh, long list. Laughing with by Regina Spector. God, I've never heard that. Okay, moving on. Donald the Duck wants to know what is the best book, non-chess book, that you've ever read, Peter. I think he probably knows how much I hate those questions, and he's asking the he's asking that question specifically. Uh, I don't know. Naming one is just completely impossible. Um, let's let's go with Wolf Hall. It's not going to be a correct answer, but let's go with Wolf Hall by by Hilary Mantel. It's a good book. It's a solid. And chance. one, and one chess book that had a big impact on you. As a kid, probably Zurich Fifty Three was my favorite book, or possibly the the very first book that, like, the very first serious book I ever had was the, the, the How to Beat Bobby Fischer. Uh, but uh, these days, yeah, you know, I mean, the, the the best chess book I've read in in recent times was, I think, for the the first volume of the Gelfand uh, series. The positional. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, those two are excellent books. I'm midway through the positional one. Um, positional and decision dynamic. Uh, positional and decision, di no, dynamic decision making. Amazing books by Boris. Uh, the next question, Peter, this is quite a fun one, actually. It's by OIT Chess Club. And he says, hi, Peter. If you were forced to do the Chess 24 version of PogChamps, did you watch the PogChamps? Some of it, not not all of it. Okay, so if you were to do a Chess 24 version of it, what celebrity would you not mind coaching? This is a fun one, Peter. Yeah, but like, how do you, how do you pick one? I've, Fine, I'll give you two. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, like, it's, this will result in me just, you know, sitting there, like going, going through, through the list of, you know, all the possible people. And, and really, I don't know, like Mike Atherton. Let's go with Mike Atherton. I, I, I think this is probably... Uh, that's actually not not a bad choice because I think he played some chess in his youth, so he wouldn't be a, a complete novice. And just generally spending time with Mike Atherton would would make me extremely happy. Right, and I'm just uh, so of course it had to be a it had to be a cricketer. Should have guessed. It didn't have to be, but <laughs> like 
once again, we don't want to be here all night. It's uh, it's way, way past some people's bedtime. I think your fans can hear you talk all day, all night long, Peter. Okay, next question by Mac. He says, hi, Peter, you're wonderful and a true legend of the game. Could you not be so modest? It's, it's a difficult. yes or a no question. <laughs> if it's a yes or a no question, then the answer is no. no. Uh, I, I think I, I once got into the situation where there was, I think, some kind of a prop bet involved where I was supposed to do some trash talk on stream. And it turned out that I'm like, I'm just so completely useless at it. I can imagine. <laughs> I, I need to train those muscles. Those are important muscles actually these days. And I just can't do it. I, I, I need to put more work in. There are now some social settings where I'm exercising those muscles, but still not, not, not nearly often enough. <sighs> All right. Well, I can, I think, what if you had to give yourself a rating on your ability to trash talk? Would it be, what, uh, I would 70, think like 1700, I don't know. Like, it's I think beyond... that's the one time you're not being modest. You're overestimating yourself. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, All I right, think... let's move on. Yeah, okay. That was actually let's mildly move. upsetting. If, if you think... <laughs> If you think this is me being over optimistic about my skills, this is mildly upsetting to me. Your trash talking skills. Peter. Yeah, I know. Like, I've, I can talk. Some, I of think might, every... some of it might be trash, you know, like. <laughs> I think you can only trash talk yourself, Peter. That's the problem. That is, that is, that is one aspect of it, which I'm very capable of. Yes. Okay, next question by Paul Petrovich. And he says, hi, Peter. I'm very impressed by your strings of victories in the Russian championships. Uh, eight times Russian champion still blows my mind. Uh, question, regarding a chess player's ability to see variations without board and pieces, for instance, study a game with sub variation directly from a book, so not having a board set up in front of you. Is this an ability which is valuable to achieve by practice? Or is it rather an ability which will materialize as a player gets stronger? I think both probably. I mm. think it's uh, I think it's very useful to try this uh, kind of early on. The moment you feel like you might be able to, obviously, it's not something that should be attempted day one of your you know being acquainted with the game. But uh, if at some point you feel like you can actually pick up a book and follow the variations in the book without having to put pieces on the board, it will. It's definitely a very <clears throat> a very useful way to uh, to develop your game, but also it will develop uh, it will develop on your own uh, as you become better and better. So I think those those are they go kind of hand in hand. It's a uh, they feed into each other uh, naturally. Yeah, I think I completely agree with you. But uh, also we hear a lot of uh, times, Peter, that you know, chess players when they are traveling and when they're on a, you know on the road. They're often talking chess without a book or without a board around or anywhere and going into long variations and everything. Uh, have you also gone through an entire book while on a plane or while on the road without any chess board around? Pretty sure Has I must happened? have. Yeah, I, I, I don't actually, like these days when I read a chess book, I don't put, put things on the board. I, I, it it yeah. will sound it will sound like a brag, but it really isn't. Unless uh, unless uh, let's say uh, if if you pick up something like a Negi opening repertoire, uh, which is a very you know very you know heavy variation heavy compute very variation heavy computer generated variation heavy because obviously opening theory these days this is not a criticism is very much driven by analyzing with computers. Uh, probably like a Negi book on on the Nidorf, I would I would need to see on some kind of a board, either a physical board or a, uh, a computer screen, uh, because you you might get get lost in all of the parentheses. Uh, yeah. But but a chess book, which is like a like a let's say a Gelfand book, uh, I would like to think I like the board probably wouldn't wouldn't be like it probably would be useful to to do it with the board to to get more feel for what he's trying to say but i should be able to follow uh to follow the variations without the board 
All right. And Bluffer, just his question kind of expands a little bit on this. And he says, hello, Peter, on how many on many occasions I've seen you not looking at the board when calculating while you're playing. When you're when you picture a board in your mind's eye, do you see it in 3D like a real board or in 2D like a like a diagram? <laughs> It's a, I've, I've, I've heard this question before and it's very difficult to answer because like you do these things instinctively. I've never tried to kind of quantify it specifically, but I think it's, it's like a mixture. I think it's probably tending towards 2D more than 3D, but it's sometimes the figures, the, the pieces will have shape, but I think probably more, more 2D than, than 3D. All right, let's move on to the next one. It's by Jordi, and he's given a couple of questions. I'm just going to pick up a few of them, which I think are really fun ones. So Jordi says, hi, Peter, here are my questions. First question, if given a choice, would you rather be A, more intelligent, B, a better chess player, C, a more likable person? <laughs> um, probably more intelligent. Okay. I, I think that covers more bases in general. I think that yeah. kind of uh, kind of allows you for more things in life. But as we've uh, established that being more intelligent doesn't necessarily make you a better chess player or a more likable person. Absolutely not. No, but I think I, I think it's a more versatile versatile thing to to go for in the list. I think if you're any more likable than you are, we might have a problem. Okay, <laughs> the next question in Jordi's series is which superpower would you like to have? Um, hmm. yeah, that's, that's a whole other thing. Uh, I mean, of the more, of the more obvious ones, probably flight, 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 like sounds like something most people would enjoy. Mm. Uh, but the utility of it is very questionable. And sort of, I'm going, the previous question I answered, I think mainly in terms of utility. And this one is, is very much a you know a like dislike answer i don't there's obviously plenty there which is a lot more useful than flight but the the feeling of flight must be must be quite enjoyable yeah you know Vita, it's like one of those questions we obviously ask on like dinner tables or with friends what superpower would you have and a lot of people say flying but it just feels like like if you could do it it would not really be I mean, it might have a novelty to it in the in the big name. Yeah, it's bit. not it's not exactly a superpower, right? Like a superpower yeah. needs to be needs to be something, you know, like invisibility like, is a superpower, or I yes. don't know, you know, shooting lasers from your eyes might be a superpower, <laughs> or you know, you could be you could be warm and you know control people with your mind. But uh, very niche reference uh, <laughs> went over my head. <laughs> but. Uh, and you know, being being warm turned out to be very useful. Uh, but yeah, I've I've never never okay. really given it much thought, and I've never really had like a them. I've ring. given it a lot of thought, and I think invisibility would be great. Yeah, but like, it's I think I think it's very difficult not to get up the mischief if you have that right. You like. You, I think it kind of instantly shifts you towards the slightly unethical side of things. The dark side. Yeah, like I think it's not that you can't use it ethically. You can use whatever, like whatever superpower ethically. But I think there is an immediate shift towards slightly unsavory things. Mm. Yeah, fair enough. Um, okay, he's actually Jody. Great, great job on the questions. I'm loving all of them. So I'm going to ask one more from his list. Um, and that is, if you had a time machine, would you rather travel to the past or to the future? Yeah, I, I have a, I have a, like, it's not a stock answer, but it's a, it's an occasion for me to use one of my favorite jokes. So I'll go with that. What do we want? Time travel. When do we want it? It's irrelevant. Wait, what? That's it? <laughs> yes. Yes. That's the entire joke. <laughs> oh, okay. I, can't, <laughs> I get it. You know, I have one more joke on this time travel thing. Let me also, I, I want to tell you about it. Okay. It's not, it's not, it's not super funny, but I'll say it. So it starts like this. Past, present and future walked into a bar. It was tense. 
All right, let's move on, Peter. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, it's a good, uh, it's a good, you know, punny, punny joke. Uh, I mean, it's is... exactly the same level as your joke, Peter. <laughs> I would, I would argue it's. Uh, they I are the different, the different kind of joke, but um, agreed, agreed. All right, next question by Clago, and he says, "Hi, Peter. I once got two games of mine critiqued by you in a video. Many thanks for that. Still a gem for me. I have a non-chess but literature-related question. Have you ever read Ulysses? And if so, did you enjoy it? And if not, why not?" Yeah, my my relationship with Joyce went as follows. Like I I belong to like my 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 circle of acquaintances and my general upbringing for, for what it's worth kind of you know dr drives you towards reading Ulysses and I didn't want to, to, to read it in in translation and I was kind of waiting until my my English becomes you know sturdy enough to 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 attempt that and then I thought I should go one better you know Ulysses is like the the milk toast, the the you know the vanilla you uh, Joyce. You should read Finnegan's Wake first. And I bought Finnegan's Wake, and I tried reading that, and it scared me so much <laughs> that I put it like I I almost never put put books away. I I I tend to finish a book I started, but Finnegan's Wake scared me so much, uh, and that was some time ago. Maybe I should try it again because my English improved actually since then. That basically, I just thought, yeah, I'm not touching Joyce after that. Uh, that's a very, very stupid thing to do, uh, I think. But that's exactly what happened. So I'm, I'm telling it like it is. No, I don't think it's stupid at all. I think you, you know, when you know. For me, it's all about Harry Potter. Okay, moving on. GM Aryan wants to know, hello, Peter. How do you, and I think this is a really good question from a chess perspective and a very important one. How do you handle crucial moments like must-win situations? And how do you develop the confidence? Because even though I prepare a lot, but still I don't develop confidence. And while others, even though they prepare less, they develop confidence and are far ahead of me. Maybe I'm wrong, but it's difficult for me to understand. All the best for the Legends of Legends tournament. Win it. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have any kind of a, you know, a silver bullet solution for this. I think it comes with experience. Uh, and if it's for some reason doesn't come with experience, uh, then it's, it's difficult to give good advice. Like I have, it's not a personal, personal story, but my, my uncle, uh, m m uh on my, on my dad's side was a very promising uh, chess player in his youth. That was ages ago. I think he was in the same group with uh, possibly Spassky. He wasn't as gifted as Spassky, obviously, or, or everybody would know of him, but uh, he was good and uh, like genuinely good. He can, still, he can still play and still follows chess quite seriously, asks me questions about my games. Al always asks me questions about the games I lost as well. So that's... Uh, uh, I whenever I whenever I lose a particularly painful game, and then and then I hear a phone call, and I and I see that number, I think to myself, "Yeah, here come the question: Why did you play that move, Peter?" Uh, but the reason I brought all of this up is he basically quit chess at about an age of fifteen to seventeen. I'm not entirely sure. I I I, I know this as a family legend, but I don't know the exact particulars. Specifically, not because he like hit some kind of a ceiling in terms of his development, uh, but simply because it didn't agree with him psychologically. Uh, he was finding the pressure of playing sort of reasonably high stakes chess, whatever high stakes chess meant in in the context of his, uh, you know, junior tournaments, too much. He just he 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 found that he loved the game, but really did not enjoy the competition aspect of it. So he just completely drifted away from that and continued following the game and reading books and following tournaments and playing occasionally in like on park benches against strangers and in the probably not anymore but he he definitely would in uh, when I was a, when I was a small child and he definitely played me when I was growing up and he like I the first time I actually beat him without like a piece piece odds was a very very joyous day. 
Uh, but yeah, like, like the, the reason I'm saying all this is uh, it's it's a legitimate thing that that can happen. The the, the amount of psychological pressure, uh, you know, attempting to play chess well puts on people should not be underestimated. And there is absolutely, you know, no no shame attached to feeling that it overwhelms you every now and again. It still overwhelms me every now and again. Uh, I have, you know, I've done well with pressure in, one, in, in, in some cases in my life. And in some other cases, I, I, you know, I can name definitely some, some very important games where I just completely, completely crumbled under, under the expectation of, uh, you know, having to perform well. Uh, but I, unfortunately, I just, I, I want to reaffirm that what's happening uh, there is, you know, not exclusive to the person asking the question, and he shouldn't feel particularly bad. Uh, but I don't have any solutions. <laughs> practice more. But that's, I think, great advice because I think the more you practice, it develops your confidence. And this is uh, this is something that we often feel if we haven't trained in chess for a while, you you feel a bit of lack of confidence going on the board. And just want to ask you one more thing about this, Peter. You know, I was watching this uh, movie on golf. It's called The Shot Game. And in that, I think there was something to the effect of that it's better to be overconfident than underconfident. Do you I would, think that's true? Agree. Yeah, I would agree with that. And also just one, one minor thing I would suggest might be useful is, uh, like once again, it's something that is much easier for me to suggest than for somebody to implement. But... Uh, if you can sort of decouple, you know, your, your, your feeling of self-worth at least a little bit from the result, that helps immensely. Like, I think I, at some point I made a conscious effort to tell myself, I don't really need these five points of rating. Mm -hmm. uh, they will, they will not like any single five points of rating being at stake in a chess game, for instance, are not going to change my life. So I should logically be a lot more relaxed about losing a game of chess after taking risks, for instance. Let's say if I feel like I need, like the tournament demands I take risks. For somebody like me who uh, I kind of dislike playing positions I don't actually enjoy playing, so I think over the course of my career, I've been somebody who, you know, I, I, I try to play quote unquote correct openings for a given value of correct and so on. And, and that leads to maybe, you know, lessening your winning chances with black against, against people you are supposed to beat because first of all, they can prepare for your repertoire. And secondly, if you're playing correct openings, you're giving them, you know, more of a chance to, you know, show you theory and so on. Uh, mm. And in order to improve for myself in those situations, I at some point started working on convincing myself that if it doesn't go well, it changes absolutely nothing in the, in, you know, in the grand scheme of things. Like my life is not going to suddenly have no meaning if I lose a game of chess. Uh, and, and that I think is quite useful, but obviously once again, it's, uh, it's easier to, easier to suggest than to actually implement when you're, at the board playing that important game of chess. As for as for your question about confidence, I think history is, you know, very very conclusively proving that uh, that people who uh, always feel they're better, uh, whatever the position is, and people who always feel they're better than their opponents, whatever the the actual situation is, have done have done well for themselves. You know, there are some. Everybody probably has their own favorite example. For me. Uh, probably once again, I of slightly different era, so I only know this according to stories. But for me, probably the most obvious example would be Mark Taimanov, uh, who was, I think, universally acclaimed as somebody who was never worse in his life, uh, and who I think, in at least in part due to that, I think probably outperformed uh, some of his contemporaries who were objectively probably stronger chess players mm. yeah no that's that's really excellently put peter because i think a lot of us also have this fear of losing rating constantly ratings become such a big thing in our head and i think what you've said is uh uh it might be hard to implement but it's it's really great advice the next question is from marshmallow to, to, to 2007 and he says hello peter what is the difference between a gm and a normal chess player 
how we can play like a gm i, I love it a, tell me pira yeah i think it's a progression i think um it's it's not something that you can just immediately quantify and put into words and say you know you have this you're a gm you don't have this you're not um uh, also you know these days gms are such a large scale that uh like the one of the questions you get asked reasonably often is like what separates let's say a 2750 player from a 2650 player and there's definitely a difference yes but i wouldn't know how to start describing it uh mm. in in some cases you know the 2650 player is just uh you know a 2750 player waiting to come to waiting to emerge uh but that's not going to be in every single case uh and uh, yeah i just it's very very difficult to uh to quantify some of it will actually come down to psychology some of it will be that you know that player who got to 20, to, to, to 2700 to 2750 these days i guess is is somebody who was at some point 2650 and was showing a lot of promise and could make the next mental step of believing in himself and pushing that little bit harder and sort of uh, uh, continuing to 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 power through uh that that particular ceiling uh and and some people kind of falter and never make that that step but yeah i i don't think it's possible to uh to quantify in terms of chess skills they're not going to be significantly different from one to another it's a progression it's like a journey from one step to another yeah, i i i think it is yeah like i think 2750 players generally know more theory mm. by by necessity because you you're just not going to get there because you know the yeah. gatekeepers the gatekeepers so to speak know so much theory that in order to you know play against them and beat them and join the club you do you do need to acquire uh that you know very hard out a shell of uh of opening knowledge because otherwise you will be you will be in trouble once you start playing in those tournaments you know beta it makes me think that is it i mean i don't know how true this is but i feel that it might actually be easier for a player who's around 2000 or 2100 to get to 2400 m- much easier compared to getting from 2650 to 2750 like even though the rating jump is less there i would think but... so yes I, th- i think you're right i yeah. think you're right i i i think that, i mean it's not an easy thing uh that is not to suggest that you know anybody who is 20 20 i don't know 2100 right yeah. now uh will be 2400 in a year uh guaranteed simply by putting the effort in but i think it's doable and i think it's actually more doable than than yeah. the, the the absolutely you know the the very biggest the, like the the highest the highest step up top there even though yes it's seemingly th- three times the points maybe it's because the amount of scope that you have in the amount of things you can improve and work on and probably that's something that contributes to that yeah that's that's definitely part of it yeah there's uh, there's abs- like there there should be all kinds of things which can be fine tuned or improved or acquired even some yes. some skills perhaps have not even been acquired by that point and then they can, they can be acquired through i don't know work or working exactly. with teachers exactly okay dupi loop loopy wants to know peter he says hello peter what do you think a chess player who works long hours on chess every day should do in his breaks to have strength to continue learning i must say that after i take a break i have less power than before so what do you recommend to do in breaks that gives you more energy to keep going at chess i'm not sure if, like something something mildly mildly physical uh, would probably be be good hydration like i'm not i'm not kidding about the hydration either like drink more water uh but for me it was one of the more uh, i wouldn't say enlightening but it made me feel a lot better about myself i remember um uh, uh i was at a training camp with i think vishe that was ages ago we we haven't really worked on chess in 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 the last decade but uh 
And I, I always had this problem that like you, you wake up, you have a, some kind of breakfast, you sit down, you work for, I don't know, three, four hours, then you have lunch. And after lunch, the first hour after lunch, you return. And the only thing you want to do is sleep. And you feel drowsy. You feel like the position kind of slightly floats before your head. And you, you like no thoughts actually cross your mind. And it's this kind of a strange, you know, I, I think what, what I'm describing there is a food coma, but, and probably eating less is useful. But, uh, <laughs> But I, I, I somehow felt, perhaps because in particular in those years, I, I did it quite a bit. Uh, I felt that this was like my unique falling and I felt very ashamed about it. And then at some point I had a conversation with Vishay about it and he confirmed to me that it's absolutely universal and I'm not the only one suffering from this affliction. And that made me feel just so much better about myself. I remember that very, very distinctly. That yeah, that's I, quite I, interesting, Peter. Because I've noticed at tournaments, a lot of the top grandmasters actually skip lunch before the game. Yeah, here I am. <laughs> so hydrate yourself and don't go into food coma. Yeah, food coma is not very useful for, you know, fast thinking. Fair enough. Next question by Krunks. And he says, hello, Peter. His question is, what are your chess plans for the future? And how do you see yourself in top chess right now? Uh, and the reason he's asking is that because lately he's seen you often commentating as well as being a second in the candidates tournament. Yeah, I think I'm kind of undergoing a very natural progression from uh, kind of a reasonably top level competitor towards more of a talking head role. Uh, I'm not prepared to, you know, this is not going to be a, you know, breaking news, Peter Fiddler announces retirement live on stream, not, not one of those things. But uh, I think it's, it's quite clear that I'm less invested in my competitive career these days than I was earlier for reasons which should be kind of self-evident. Uh, and I'm also really enjoying the, the other things I'm doing. So I think it's a uh, uh, it's all working out reasonably, uh, reasonably well. Uh, I'm still, I'm still planning to uh, to play in the important events, but how many of them are left in my career, I, I honestly don't know. There, I'm, I'm basically okay. taking it on a very kind of a day-to-day -day basis these days. In particular, right now, I find it very difficult to formulate any kind of long-term plans. Uh, because uh, it feels like a fool's errand to plan to plan anything until you know. I would like 2021 to 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 already be the current year, and then maybe <laughs> then maybe we can we can make some tentative plans for the future. You looking forward to getting back to over the board chess? Yes, but I think mainly for the social element of it. Uh, I. I am not in the, you know, sort of hardcore, uh, let's not turn chess into an e-sport mm. camp. Even even softcore, I'm not there. I quite like the current iteration. I think there's some very interesting chess being played and I don't mind the format. I don't mind the, the shorter time control. I know that there are some people whose opinion I respect out there who uh, feel like, you know, over the board classical chess cannot come back quickly enough you know they, they, they really don't feel what's going on right now has you know any particular merit i'm very much in disagreement with that with that opinion but uh what i miss the most is is you know seeing the people i like seeing my colleagues hanging around with my colleagues and uh yeah. that that definitely is something i would very much enjoy right now more more human interaction I couldn't agree more with you. I think online chess is is amazing and the boom and the interest and everything, how chess has brought the community together in these tough times is amazing, but I don't think it can replace over the board chess, whether it's it, as part the social angle, the interaction, the human angle, all of that, we all miss that. And hopefully, like you said, 2021 will come soon enough. Next question is by Lucas. Bedri Choksi, and he says, hello, Peter. Thank you for your time answering our questions. I'm wondering what your opinion is on current trends in approaching the game of chess. 
it seems to be trendy to simply go on blitz marathons and pump out 100 200 games a day instead of studying classical games what is your opinion opinion on that and how effective do you think is this modern way of approaching the game i don't know if it's true honestly i i'm not sure i agree with the premise and it's very difficult to answer a question when you kind of disagree with the premise i i I think the people who just play blitz online were probably always going to just play blitz online and don't really even necessarily feel like they're doing it to develop their chess game. I think they just en- enjoy playing blitz online. Mm. And and I mean nothing there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but I I don't think you know it's a it's either or. I think people who want to get better will probably put some some time into studying and people who enjoy chess as a you, you know this relaxing pastime which also has a way of keeping score it's, it's kind of important to be able to keep score and uh uh you know trying to uh to improve your uh online rating on on sites is is a very handy way of keeping easy score uh but yeah i'm i'm not sure very many people who are actually serious about their game use it as their mm. as their sole method of you know quote unquote improving because i think most people realize that just just spamming blitz nonstop and doing nothing else is just not going to be very helpful it's it's useful to like th- there are definitely ways to uh to incorporate playing online blitz which will be useful for instance if you're but trying to pick up a new opening uh you can click what how how however much you like and you can you know read however many books you like but until you get the reps in until you actually study, you know get to play those structures get to play those positions and people start asking you questions people start posing you problems and then you you know it all settles in your head like until you get those those practice games in uh yeah. you're just never going to know exactly what you don't understand about the opening um so uh, using internet blitz for for that for instance is is a very very uh, it's a very good very good tool but uh j- just spamming 200 blitz games a day i don't think anybody calls that training hmm so but blitz in moderation but it has to be along with actual study of chess as well to improve yeah i think i think it it cannot be the only thing you do in chess because yes. that that will i mean you probably will become better at at online blitz so if if you're training for something which is sort of specifically online blitz then yes by all means play a lot of online blitz it will make you like it probably wouldn't have been you know poor training for me for this event actually in some ways because it would make me a lot more confident about you know handling time pressure and not panicking on on very low time and i have actually done some of that in preparation for this tournament it wasn't hugely successful but uh i felt like i needed to play a little bit more online chess just to kind of reacquaint myself uh with uh, uh that that aspect of it like the, the the just getting used to to doing it uh but yeah you, you can't you can't subsist only on that I was actually about to ask if playing online had a part to play in your prep for the tournament. So good, you already answered that. A little that. bit, yeah, a little bit, but not not a ton. And also, okay. like, it's very difficult to, uh, you know, force yourself to play fifteen plus ten. And I'm not sure how much playing, let's say, three plus one, or or three plus zero, tr- you know, trains you for fifteen plus ten games against the world's top ten. Those are going to be slightly different things. Fair enough. Next question is by chess.inc and he says hi Peter my grandmaster trainer says the same thing as Tukmakov believed in his book to improve in chess calculation tactics assessment planning i found books for everything but i don't know how to improve my positional evaluation orient myself in unknown positions what's your advice for that There is some literature now which i think is once again i i i feel like every stream i do remotely in this format I, i i find an opportunity to praise boris gelfand's uh books at least once probably twice or, or three times uh but there's definitely some literature out there on on the topic of 
of how to approach, you know, thinking about positional aspects of chess. But once again, I'm 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 going to to go the the boring route and say, uh, without practice, it's just not going to work. It's uh, and that's also something that I spoke about just uh, 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 when I was answering for the previous question. Uh, unfamiliar positions will remain unfamiliar and difficult to assess until you put the reps in. There's just no substitution for uh, playing them. You Nobody uh, will be able to, like unless there's something you can calculate. If you show me some kind of, I don't know, Queen's Indian position uh, by move 15, and, and it's an opening I've played maybe five times in my entire life with both colors combined. You, you show me some, some position in the Queen's Indian by move 15 uh, and ask me who is better. And I mean, we might as well toss a coin. I might be right. I might be wrong. There is absolutely no way I can do it properly. If you show that same position to Sergei Karekin, who has played the opening his entire life, he probably will take three seconds and tell us, and he will mo more likely than not be in, like very, very close to, to, to the truth straight away. So there is just no substitution to, to, uh, to practicing. Uh, it's it's not something that uh, I think you can train in any other way. Fascinating. And it also reminds me, Peter, of something uh, that Vishy said, which was on similar lines as well, that even when you study other aspects like calculation and tactics, unexpectedly, it also improves things that you don't expect, like positional evaluation. Do you think that's accurate? Yeah, because it's all... A lot of it comes down to pattern recognition, mm -hmm. and uh, and this is where it's problematic, and, and this is why you know understanding new openings, for instance, takes a while because your brain just isn't uh, isn't wired yet to to recognize those patterns, and they all they all kind of look the same to you, and you're it's guesswork. For a while, it is sort of educated guesswork, but the more the more you play, and the more you let's say solve. Uh, problems which are sort of adjacent to those structures, uh, the more you learn to recognize uh, things which help your uh, instant kind of a snap judgment on, on what the position is assessed. Yes. Yes. All right. Great. Um, next question. Hopper is 1981 and he says, why do you think your attachment to the Grunfeld defense is stronger than your attachment to any other opening that has been part of your repertoire? Grateful. Thanks for answering and best wishes for the rest of the tournament and onwards. Yeah. Also perfect, perfect day to answer, to answer <laughs> that question because I played two slabs today, scored zero points. Probably, uh, probably should have played. Poof is in the pudding. <laughs> yeah, like uh, it's obviously I couldn't have done any worse if I played the Grunfeld, and I could have potentially done better. Uh, so I don't know. Grunfeld just strikes all the right notes for me. Uh, it's also, of course, inertia. You know, large parts of it will be inertia because I've invested so much time into studying the opening that it's the easiest for me to play. I I, I know quite a bit about it even now. I'm not as current in the opening as I, I think I was in other, other periods of my career, but I still have a pretty good understanding of what belongs where and so on. And uh, it's the easiest for me to autopilot. Uh, so there's, there's clearly those reasons, but it also, I think, is an opening which is very, very well suited to what kind of a chess player I am at heart. You know, I, I, I like... Uh, at least having a chance of active play. I like feeling like I will have winning chances. Uh, and uh, I think Grunfeld provides just the right amount of disbalance uh, for those things to be to be generally true. Of course, against a well-prepared opponent, no opening actually gives you winning chances with black to begin with. Uh, they, they come later when your opponent starts making mistakes if he does start making making mistakes but structurally let's say uh Grunfeld will give you more more disbalanced positions than let's say the queen's gambit accepted that i think is very difficult to disprove 
Right. And I think this is also, Peter, a great moment to just plug in your series for Chess 24 on the on the Grunfeld uh, for advanced players. I think uh, there's a brilliant series done by eight times Russian champion Peter Swidler on the Grunfeld. Uh, Peter, have you been uh, very, I mean, the ideas that you put into it, uh, tell us a little bit about your investment in this series and and all that you've explained in it. Give us a little, uh, give us a little idea on on the series. Well, it's uh, I'm I'm still very proud of it, uh, and uh, it was it was kind of interesting because it was my first foray into that genre in my entire life. I've never really done any kind of uh, uh, like serious opening uh, work and you know in the shape of books or lectures or anything until I uh, started that project, and that was ages ago. By this point, that was. Um, I think it, I, I recorded between like 2012 and 2013, maybe even uh, bleeding into 2014 a little bit. Um, and uh, I, as I finished it, I had a feeling what I did was decent, but I really had no idea if, uh, uh, let's say, the jury of my peers will think it's any good. Uh, I was reasonably confident uh it was going to do the job that it was supposed to be doing, such as you know teaching people who wanted to pick up that opening the uh, like the basic ideas and the lines and so on. But I've had very strong players tell me that they actually chose to uh, to, to to get it and to go through it, and they felt I've I've done a good job and. I, that that felt to me like a very very you know gratifying uh, uh, gratifying thing because it's one thing to believe that you have put put your sort of your heart into it and uh, I really like there are some mistakes uh, some have been pointed out to me and obviously theory has progressed a great deal and computers have become stronger and so on and there is no way there aren't any inaccuracies in there but I can definitely say that at the moment of uh, me recording it. I believed every word I said. I've, I I kept some lines to myself so that I can play the opening. It's uh, I, I there's definitely some some bits in there where <clears throat> let's say I had an option of showing option A or option B and I had to choose and I I chose to show one and not both. Let's say because you you still would like to be able to continue being a a professional chess player after you've done that and it was at that point my only opening but i i definitely believed every single word i said in the videos uh and i think uh i think the course is good i think it probably still does a very good job for intermediate players it probably like if you want to build your 27 plus 100 repertoire on it you might run into issues <laughs> like if, if somebody decided to i don't know if somebody got invited into the candidates, for instance, and decided to pick up the Grunfeld solely based on on the course, that probably is unwise. But right. uh, so what you're saying is, unless you're going to play the candidates, it's a good enough course to play the Grunfeld. <laughs> but but I'm still I'm still very proud of it because I I, I feel I feel like I've done uh, I've done a very uh, very decent job. Uh, getting across both sort of the, the the facts of the matter and also the spirit of the opening. Because for me, as I said, Grunfeld has always been, uh, you know, about the kind of positions, not just specifically the variations, but I, I really like the type of games this opening leads to. And I was trying whenever possible to kind of uh, pass that enthusiasm for, for those sharp and balanced positions. And I think I think I've done I've done reasonably well. All right. Well, Peter, when you say decent and good for us normal people, that basically means marvelous and mind blowing and beyond yeah. reach. Okay, let's move on to the next question by Flint's backer, and he says, "I'm." Um, Sorry if I pronounced that wrong, but he says, good evening, Peter. There are enough questions for chess, but I want to know what's your favorite food. By the way, I had the luck to see you playing. It was in Munich 2016 when you won against Parligras and Smits. So he saw you play there and he wants mm. to know what's your favorite food. <laughs> that, was a, that was a good weekend. I, I, I normally don't win both games in, in, in the same Bundesliga weekend. So 
that that was a very memorable weekend for sure. Uh, favorite food? I'm I'm fairly omnivorous. Omnivorous. Where do you? I can't. I can't even. Uh, but um, if if we're going for like the the more general like which cuisine, it's probably going to be Indian. I, and, and, not, and not not because not because of uh, you interviewing me. I've I've been I've been a huge huge fan of uh, Indian food for decades. Uh, and just generally sort of South Asian uh, subcontinental food. Uh, but in terms of like a single dish, I probably would still go with a very good steak if you can get it, mm -hmm. uh, which I understand is not very Indian, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so It's but literally as I said, like the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but as I said, I, I, I basically eat everything. So it's... Um, so a steak... Indian and everything in the middle. Pretty, pretty much, yeah, pretty much. Fair enough. All right. Uh, why must I lose to this? Bogues is asking, and <laughs> I love the username because we know a certain Max G. Bogues from Chess Twenty Four. Uh, and why must I lose to this? Bogues is asking. How would the great Soviet players of the sixties, Petrosian, Geller, Tal, Spassky, etc., do against today's grandmasters? I think depend depends hugely on how much time you give them to reacquaint themselves with opening theory. They would just That's get point. they would just get slaughtered in the openings. If you if you sort of revive them now, uh, yeah. revive them now with the opening knowledge they had in those years, they would struggle to get out of the opening with black. I feel, yeah. uh, but given time to uh, to adjust. And given time to to study what theory has progressed to, I think they would have done fine. I don't know what fine like fine is a is a cop out, obviously in this in this answer. But I think uh, their generation already understood chess well enough and played modern enough chess to not really struggle against the current crop. Uh, and by current crop, we once again we need to you, you know the. Uh, sort of, if we take average room temperature. We don't take like we we don't pair them exclusively against Magnus, yes. because that would be that would be a struggle. <laughs> but that, that's for also anyone. a struggle. Yeah, but that's also a struggle for anybody else. Uh, <laughs> but in a in a some kind of a top field these days, I think they wouldn't have done they wouldn't have done poorly. I don't think. Yeah, uh, uh, I I think. Uh, like the level of top top players has, is is generally improving from generation to generation. But if we talk about, let's say, the names you mentioned, they already are uh, sort of plenty strong enough to to hold their own against the current crop. That would be my my first thought, though. I've never really, you know, done any sims or <laughs> or anything like that. Yeah, I think like what you're saying about them having a very solid foundation as terms as far as concepts and um, ideas are concerned are very strong. And what you said, like about just reviving them, it makes me think of Captain America. Like you just get them from the past. They need time to to understand what they're getting yeah, into. Definitely, yeah. They it's without without some time to to ground themselves in in what's been happening in the past 50 years it's it's going to be an uphill battle of course but fair uh, enough skill wise i don't think there's such a huge gap yeah that's a good point okay next question by axet and he says peter you lived closely the last years of the russian world apogee and the total dominance of chess where where you always won the olympiads and the elite was mostly from mostly formed by Russian players. That changed some years later. Did you perceive this as kind of a lag? How did you perceive the emergence of new talents outside of Russia? I'm not sure how to answer that, honestly. Uh, I mean, the whole not winning the Olympiad since 2002 thing is very painful and uh, you know, remains a, a hugely traumatic thing for, I think, any, any Russian player who played for the national team in the intervening years. Uh, but I think it's 
it's a natural progression of the world. Like uh, generally, we should welcome the fact that uh, the geography of top-level chess is, you know, as varied as it is right now, and uh, the the hegemony uh, Soviet Union has enjoyed was not going to be sustainable. Uh, and obviously, parts of it are geopolitical, but uh, not just that. Like, like the, the the early reason why we started losing the Olympiads was that uh, you know the the teams which normally would just delegate their top two boards to the Soviet team were mm. now separate teams. Uh, so, like the, the 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 first time, see, Soviet Union did not win the nineteen seventy six Olympiad. And then we, I, I still say we, but like I think I think it's understood what I mean there. Uh, won every single one until 2002, and then Ukraine and Armenia started winning them, kind of taking turns to win them. Uh, and that obviously is a direct consequence of uh, the Soviet Union no longer being a country. Uh, so that's that's how the process began. Uh, one unbelievably strong team spawned a number of very very strong teams because the uh, the chess culture in in the old Soviet Union was uh, was so strong and so well spread that uh, now there were like three to five top teams fighting when pre previously it was it was just one super team. But also the emergence of China as a, as a, as a superpower on uh, on the chess stage, and uh, how you know generally, like I think we are getting very very close to the moment when the Indian kids will just send this team of seventeen year olds, which will just start winning everything. Uh, so I don't know how many Olympiads away are we, but I think it's just around the corner, right? When the, in the, when, yeah. when this will become a reality and you know things happening in Iran uh, it's very good to see uh, I think you know for anybody who is even slightly impartial uh, it's a it's a much better picture uh, I would like for Russia to win an Olympiad eventually because we just need this monkey off our back of it like it's I'm, I'm very at peace with the fact that it's not going to be me but somebody, please, please win the Olympiad. I just, I just need this. I just need this conversation to be over. Uh, but overall, I'm, I'm very happy with, uh, with how wide the geography has become. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and also, as a chess player, it's of course really nice to see different countries produce a lot of talent. Uh, you yourself have won five gold medals. At the Olympiad, so, yeah. uh, the team, so. yeah. yeah, and um, uh, it's really nice to hear you say that even if you're not part of the team, you're really waiting for Russia to win that next gold medal because uh, you just yeah, it's a uh, it's uh, it's become an issue, uh, <laughs> and uh, I think it's annoying everybody, and uh, I would like it to stop annoying us. Well, it's not annoying the people who are actually winning the Olympia. I I, un I I understand that. I understand that's uh, you know a, a very okay. biased viewpoint, but <laughs> fair enough. Next question, and I think Peter, this is going to be our last question of the day, is by Panaj, and Panaj says, Peter, question about chess and midlife crisis. So it's perfect. We'll just end at some midlife crisis here. It happens that you and I are exactly the same age to the very day. When's your birthday, Peter? Uh, 17th of June. Okay. So apart from the very obvious difference in playing standards between us, the fact that you're still playing dynamic grunt fields, etc. in early middle age has started to bother me. For my... <laughs> I like this person. <laughs> for my I... own part... For my own part, since turning 40, I find myself mysteriously drawn to the black side of Geico pianos and QGDs. I'm worried that these are the chess playing equivalents of a pipe and slippers, and that I'm really putting the decline in the Queen's Gambit decline. <laughs> I really like this person. <laughs> you guys are born on the same day, so... <laughs> 
How have you kept your mojo up? And do you think there is a correlation between chess playing styles and seven ages of man? Thank you. I think that's a great question, Peter. Take yeah, the floor. I've, I'm, 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 I'm thankful for the question. And I mean, for me, the as I said, part of the reason I still play the the, the dynamic openings, mainly with black though, not so much with white, uh, is because. This is the easiest for me to do. I think uh, had I been the QGD player all my life, I would be sort of more hardcore into, QG, into QGD these days. Uh, but there's definitely some validity to the question in that uh, motivating myself to, uh, to play chess competitively is probably the biggest, uh, you know, the single biggest problem I've encountered in the past, I don't know, five years, just uh, uh, explaining to myself again why I need to take this seriously. And uh, uh, one of the reasons I found, one of the ways I found of, of, of coping with that problem uh, was to tell myself, uh, in as much as possible, let's just ignore the, the results part of it and try to get sort of new experiences going. And uh, in that regard, I, I tried without success, frankly, but I did try many new things in terms of openings. And I'm gen generally very open to, uh, you know, playing in familiar positions after one, one hour of prep and things of that nature, because uh, it does take me out of the, uh, I, I hate that cliche, but it does take me out of, of my comfort zone in terms of, you know, playing yet another game, game of chess like the 30 I played, played before, sort of. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very tempted, like, I don't know how, how much you follow cricket and, and cricket punditry, uh, but uh, I... I can I can indulge myself once here, right? Uh, right. There is a there is a famous quote by by Shane Warren about Monty Panesar. Monty Panesar played uh, played I think thirty two or thirty three tests for England uh, in this decade. A uh, very exciting cricketer for many many reasons. And uh, Warren at some point said that uh, he, it feels to me uh, to him that Monty did not play thirty two tests. He played the same test thirty two times. Uh, and uh, this is a feeling I would very much like to avoid these days. Yeah. I don't really want to play. It's obviously never going to be exactly the same game of chess, but I would like to steer as far away from the feeling that I'm playing the same game of chess I've already played uh, as possible. Sadly, and we've touched on this before, these days, uh, in particular against top opposition, they're just not going to let you uh, without serious opening prep you're just not going to get any game of chess if you if you try to do that uh, which is what i'm finding out uh to no real surprise but uh, this is what i'm what i'm sort of finding out but i'm still trying uh because uh yeah without that feeling of novelty uh it's it's very difficult to uh, to motivate yourself to continue that's actually a really nicely put peter the fact that part of the motivation comes from wanting to get out of your comfort zone, play something new and learn something new. And, and the whole analogy that you drew about not playing the same game again is, is a huge part of keeping the mojo up for the game. All right. And with that, I am going to wrap up the Q&A section. Peter, thank you so much. Uh, before you go, of course, I have to ask one of my own questions, which is that tomorrow you're playing against Jan. Your thoughts going into tomorrow's game? Uh, not looking forward to it. <laughs> not really looking forward. Like uh, I think his particular brand of chess is is very very well suited to playing against somebody like me. Uh, and by that I mean sort of slow and uh, old. <laughs> I feel like this is really not the note we should be ending this session on, Peter. Uh, I'm sorry. Like we. <laughs> I find it very difficult. <laughs> I find it very difficult not to be truthful about questions being put. I love it. Way. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Well, you say what you want, uh, but we 
I disagree with everything that you just said for the last question. Okay. I wish you all the best for tomorrow. Thank you. Get some rest. And thank you so much for your time. This was fun. Thank you. Go for a hike in the woods, preferably off trail to make the trip even more stimulating for your brain. Nature walks can also reduce stress. My name is Sebastian Mihailov, and I bring to you, along with the world champion Magnus Carlsen, the wonderful app Tactics Frenzy. Solve millions of unique, high quality, and entertaining chess puzzles that have all been quality checked by strong grandmasters like Jun Ludwig Hammer and Jan Gustafsson. Become a member today and compete for monthly prizes sponsored by Chessable, Chess24, Magnus Trainer, and of course, the king himself, Magnus Carlsen. We have made sure that no matter how good you are at chess, you can enjoy this app and get the challenge of your life. Alireza Veruja, Alexander Grishek, Sergei Karyakin, among a lot of elite players, they all love the app, and I can assure you, you will as well. Download the app today and become a chess champion. I believe in curiosity and never stop challenging myself. Technology has come a long way. Still, nothing beats the capabilities of the human brain. At Merck, we believe that